Okay, I'd like to take this opportunity to welcome everybody to uh, this morning's event, Model ETF Portfolio Sneak Preview. It's Saturday, October 9th. You've got John Hopkins and my partner, Tom Bowley, will be jumping in just a minute. I wanna welcome uh, anybody new to Earnings Beats. Thanks for taking the time to stop in. I hope you enjoy it. Of course, I wanna thank our veterans, members who've been with us for some of you many, many years completely and totally wonderful to have you as uh, supporters of the um, of our business. Thank you so much. I want to mention a couple of quick things before Tom comes in. Uh, number one, we record all of our events. So if for some reason, you're not able to stick around, don't worry about it. We'll make sure you get um, a recording of the event. And those who are members of Earnings Beats, of course, get access to our archive of educational videos. We have a lot of them covering many, many topics to do with technical analysis, the market, et cetera. So if you become a member, you'll have access to all of our great educational events. Next, we have a lot of events coming up in October. It's one of those months. And I'm gonna ask Chris to share if you can, the um, upcoming events. So of course we have our event today uh, that's going on. Um, then come Monday, we've got our um, Q3 earnings sneak preview. This is also a public event, right? So our events are the public or membership. Public, open to anybody who's part of the earnings beats community, don't need a membership, public, and then um, the private membership, those are events that are exclusive to our subscribing members. So anyways, so Monday we've got the, um, just go back a little bit, Chris. Monday we've got the, the um, sneak preview Q3 earnings event. Earnings season right around the corner. Tom will be spending a lot of time talking about um, companies with upcoming earnings and some of the things we'll be looking at when companies start reporting those numbers in droves. On Tuesday, we've got our Max Payne uh, webinar. This is Options Max Payne. Max Payne, very popular. <laughs> we have really been spot on these last couple of Max Payne webinars. This is where Tom looks at the major indexes and individual stocks to see which ones might make sizable moves up or down between the event on Tuesday and Friday when you've got the monthly options expiration. And we've had some tremendous winners. Um, that's one, if you're a member, we invite you to come. And if you're uh, not a member, you can take a trial membership and be part of that. Then after that, we've got a really unique and interesting event uh, coming up. This is next Saturday at 11 a.m. It's our chart fest. And you're gonna have uh, Tom Boley and we're gonna have Grayson Rose and we're gonna have Dave Keller from Stock Charts joining uh, Tom. Um, and they're gonna be getting into charts, chart fest. And there's gonna be more information on this one. Uh, this is one that I think everybody's gonna find to be extremely valuable. You'll get more information on that. Uh, throughout this week coming up. Okay, then after that, we've got our Q3 earnings. So remember, we've got this upcoming Monday. It's a sneak preview to give you an idea of what's going to be covered. That's open, open to the public. The following Monday, October 18th, that's members only. And that's when Tom's really going to delve into companies that have already reported and could be great trading candidates. It's going to be looking at companies with upcoming earnings and which ones he thinks might knock it out of the park, which, one, which ones might uh, be weak. Extremely valuable information. We'll, give you more, we'll get you more information on that one as well. Then we've got our um, model ETF portfolio, members only. That'll be the follow-up to today's webinar where Tom's gonna spend some time explaining uh, what he'll be going through. And we have this mem members only event on Tuesday, October 19th. So hopefully, 
after today, you'll uh, find this of interest. You'll be able to take out a trial membership for no cost and then uh, get in on all of these uh, events. Okay, um, I think that's enough events, Tom, for this month. And um, I wanna see if you're about ready to roll here so we can uh, get this thing going. I am. Uh, I'm just wondering if I have to be at all these events. <laughs> well, yes, <laughs> you do. As a matter of fact, I'll tell you the one event I'm really excited about is that Chart Fest. That's yeah. going to be interesting because you've got two heavy hitters from stock charts coming on with you. That's um, that's quite a you know that's quite a coup for you to get these guys to come. <laughs> You know, on a Saturday, and I think that's going to be a very well attended uh, event. I'm looking forward to that one. Yeah, I really like the approach um, that both Dave and and Grayson take uh, in terms of uh, they're both very very disciplined in their approach and their different approaches. And so the whole idea of Chart Fest is really to kind of uh, show you know about stock charts, you know the platform and how Dave uses it, how Grayson uses, it, how we use it at earnings beats and then simply just to pour into charts. I mean, just chart after chart after chart. So if you've somebody who really enjoys looking at the charts and maybe hopefully picking up a, some pointers along the way um, and maybe some great trading candidates, uh, one of the things that, you know, I'm gonna talk to Dave and Grayson about are trying to provide some charts of stocks that they really like as we go into, you know, ladder, more into the fourth quarter. Mm -hmm. We do have earnings getting ready to come out um, they also use relative strength like I do in their analysis, which I think is so important. Um, so I'm really looking forward to it. It's always fun getting together with those guys. I know they're really busy over at Stock Charts all the time. So it is, uh, it is good that they'll take the time out on a Saturday to come join us. Yeah. And it's a free hey, just, Yeah. Just, just before you jump in, I want to point people, uh, if you look at this um, uh, slide up there, and you'll see if you go to Earnings Beats, the membership, if you click on that uh, membership link you will see that you can uh you can uh, you can sign up for a basically a trial no cost membership for 30 days and if there ever was a great time to do it tom it's now because you'll get in on all these events that are coming up and i'm telling these are powerful events uh coming up particularly as we get into earning season and uh as a member you'll get into Again, you'll get into that Max Payne webinar, which is going to be awesome. They've been, Thomas really just <laughs> knocks them out of the park in terms of companies that made big moves between the event and the Friday expiration and even into the following week. Um, and then, of course, you'll get into uh, the Q3, you'll get into the ETF webinar where Tom actually unveils the ETFs he's going to discuss a little bit today. And then that Q3 earnings season is powerful because you're going to see which companies already by that time have reported. Tom will be discussing where you might, you know, enter some of those positions on pullbacks. And then thousands of companies literally reporting with many of them ending up on our strong earnings chart list, which is available to our members, very powerful list, as well as other chart lists that are um, extremely valuable, you know, for looking for trading candidates. So you sign up for the 30-day um, no-cost trial. You'll get into all these events we have coming up, and I'm sure we'll have some others coming up. Oh, I know we will uh, in November as well. We'll have our uh, model portfolio and the other three portfolios, Tom unveils at that time. So Tom, as great a time as any to, um, to give us a try here. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I want to get into this, uh, the ETF sneak preview here. So we're going to get that going in one second. I just want to make one more comment about the free trial. If you take one out now, it'll take you 30 days into uh, that first week of November. And historically, I mean, we haven't even talked about it yet, but we normally have a spring and fall special for our annual membership. And that normally will fall right around the time that your 30 day trial would end. So this really is a good time because uh, I'm sure by then we will have announced what our fall special is going to be. And mm -hmm. uh, so anybody coming in, I think can take advantage of that. It's usually a, a really good deal. That saves you a okay. lot of money on the monthly membership. All right, I'm going to step aside here. And um, if there are any questions, you know, try to hold them till the end. If I can answer any during the event, I will, but uh, we'll have a little bit of time, hopefully at the end, Tom, to uh, answer a couple questions as well. Okay. 
Sounds good. All right, so today is all about um, the ETF portfolio and how we put together our model ETF portfolio. And we started doing this uh, about a year ago. And the reason we did it is we had a lot of members asking us about ETFs. You know, we're always talking about individual stocks. Why don't we do something with ETFs? And so I thought what we would do is kind of take our approach, relative strength, looking at, you know, momentum, uh, those types of things, and put together uh, a model ETF service that not only provides that information, but also um, really tries to provide a lot of education for our members as far as getting everyone in the habit of doing a little bit of research just to make sure you understand what you own. That's, the, that's kind of our, our mantra or mantra at um, Earnings Beats is know what you own when it comes to these ETFs, because I've had so many discussions with, uh, with friends and even members in the past that tell me, you know, they, they, don't, they don't like um, trading individual stocks. They don't want to own individual stocks. So therefore they just want to own ETFs. And I've had discussions where I've said, well, you do know that ETFs own individual stocks, right? And they kind of look at me like, no, I own ETFs. And so it's kind of a, for, for many, and I know there's plenty of you out there that trade ETFs that know what you own, but um, there's, a, there's more, it's a deeper level of knowing what you own. That's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. But let me go ahead. I'm going to share my screen here um, and just show you how we start out our process. So we have a, what we call a strong ETF chart list that we update roughly about once a month. And the way that we, we uh, go about um, doing this ETF uh, chart list is we start off with a scan. So it's no magic, you know, I'm not going in and looking at every ETF manually and trying to figure out what we're gonna put. What I'm normally doing is I'm going in and I'm uh, basically putting a scan together based on what the market looks like. For instance, one of the line items that I use frequently is just the PPO line. I wanna make sure that the PPO, um, which is a momentum indicator, is at least uh, greater than one, which means that it's gonna be above the center line, which suggests that we're in an uptrend. So it's going to eliminate any ETF that does not have a PPO of at least one. I'm gonna look for the scooter, which is more of a relative strength score at stock charts. If you're not familiar, you can go into uh, their little search button over here and type in SCTR and they'll give you plenty of information on it. But it's, uh, it's an acronym for stock charts technical rank developed by John Murphy, who's a legend in technical analysis. And the scooter just helps us identify what is working relative to its peers. So if you get an ETF that has a scooter score greater than 80, it means that based on the formula, it is outperforming 80% of the other ETFs. All right, so that's the scooter. Then I've got this uh, group is ETF NOUI. So basically what this is, is just a um, part of this, the scan syntax, which tells the, the scan engine, we don't want inverse ETFs. We don't want leveraged ETFs. We wanna stick with just the basic ETFs. So that's going to take out a lot of, you know, the juiced ETFs or leveraged ETFs along with the inverse ETFs and so forth. So we're getting rid of all those. And then I normally will have some kind of a volume. This is probably, you know, we could probably even go lower. You know, the, the difference in what you can buy and sell an ETF can really um, be dictated quite a bit by the volume. So that's one of the problems if you get an ETF that maybe only trades 500 shares a day you got to be careful that you're not, you know, paying a little bit too much in terms of the, the, the discrepancy in the bid and the ask. Um, so I normally have some sort of a volume threshold that I want to, you know, use. But if I put all of this in and then I just run this once, once a month, so I'll run a scan and I'll see what comes up. So here I've got the scan results. Now here's 48. Now I can tell you next month because it is a, or not next month, next week, when we do this before our model ETF draft, I will probably change some of these parameters. I'll, I'll probably come down maybe to 70. Maybe I'll go to 0 0.5, you know, because the market's been weak. I may even go to 0, 0.0. Someone asked me one time when I was going over this webinar, they said, well, 
you're not going to, what do you do if there's a bear market? Or what do you do if the market's selling off for a period of time? Well, we're going to adjust what we're going to look for. I mean, obviously, you're not, we're not going to have the same criteria in different market environments. If the market is bullish, we're going to probably have to raise this PPO line, or we're going to have hundreds of ETFs maybe that are going to meet the criteria. If I go down to 10,000 shares, I mean, let's, let's just, you know, for the sake of argument, let's say we go 10,000. Let's say we use the zero and let's say the scooter only has to be 50. So if I run the scan, now I've got 245. Well, that's way too many. You know, I don't want that. So I'm going to manipulate the syntax to try to get that number down to a manageable level of leading ETFs. So I'm going to, you know, go back to maybe 70. And then I'm going to say, okay, give me 0.5 and give me 50,000. So it's now instead of 245, that just took me down to 85. Now I got a little bit more manageable uh, um, in or, um, chart list that I'll be able to work with, sample size, whatever. Um, and then what I end up doing is I go through here and anything that's non-US related or doesn't involve stocks, I generally throw them out. So, you know, the commodities, they're going to get tossed. Uh, the dry bulk shipping, probably going to get tossed. Um, oil funds going to get tossed. Anything dealing with foreign markets, Indonesia, Philippines, they're all going to get tossed. And I'm hopefully going to be left with at least, you know, my goal is to have maybe somewhere between about 30 and anywhere up to maybe 80, 90 ETFs on our strong ETF chart list. Now, that's just a chart list that has all of these different ETFs in it where you can pull up the charts and you can look at the charts. Um, once we have that, members can download that chart list. Stock charts members that are at least extra or pro members can take that chart list and they can download it right into their account. Um, and usually I have those ETFs set up a little bit differently. The charts, I have the scooter on there. Uh, I'll have the ETF relative to the S&P 500 on the chart so that you can kind of get a sense for how the ETF not only has been performing recently, but then how it's been performing over a long period of time versus the S&P. So that gives you a little bit more of technical history that you can look at to see if it's maybe, and, and obviously you can also look at the volatility. Some of these might be steady growers. Some others might just be all over the place. Um, so you can get a, a technical sense of whether it's an ETF that you'd be interested in. And then once we have all these in a chart list, um, we're going to um, put them into um, a what we call our ETF analyzer, which is an Excel spreadsheet. It's an interactive tool that our members can use. Now, we do ask, ask for those who use the tool to be annual members, but I can tell you probably 90% of our members are annual members to begin with because we offer such a great deal. I mean, if you're a, if you're a monthly member, you should definitely write into us um, and save some money. And uh, you can write into uh, support at earningsbeats.com and just say you're a monthly member, you're interested in an annual membership. Because usually what we'll do, especially if you're in uh, one of these webinars or something, we normally will give you not only 12 months at a heavily discounted rate, but also we normally throw in a bonus month. So, you know, definitely keep that in mind um, to get the most for your money in terms of membership with Earnings Beats. But if you are an annual member, we will provide you um, a link where you can download the Excel spreadsheet and write in, and then you can use it interactively to kind of figure out what you want to do. And I'm going to show you how you can do that in just a minute. Before I do that, I want to just go over to an uh, article that I wrote this weekend for chart watchers. And because I, I dealt a little bit with the ETF. And so let me see. So I wrote an article, The Secret to Selecting the ETFs that are right for you. And if you click on this, um, you'll see this is kind of a, just a little snippet of the spreadsheet that I'm going to go over with you in just a minute. But you can see the one of the ETFs that I featured was just this momentum factor ETF. Well, when you look at the name, you don't even know what's in it. I mean, momentum, what, what type of momentum? What, was it momentum from six months ago? Was it momentum a year ago? Was it momentum last week? You know, what is it invested in? Well, you'll see that we're going to break all of that down for you. Um, and then we always give the top 10 holdings 
of each ETF. And so you can see how this is shown. Uh, and again, I'm gonna pull up the spreadsheet in just a minute. So I don't really wanna get into all that, but I wanted to show you that article. So if you are an ETF fan, you might wanna go in and read my article uh, from Chart Watchers. The other uh, article I just wrote it this morning was know what you own. Um, and again, talking about ETFs, I just literally published this maybe an hour ago, uh, well, 58 minutes ago. And the chart I wanted to show you here. So I went through this example of two financial ETFs. And sometimes I know folks will buy ETFs just based on the name. So financial ETF means it owns financials, right? Well, I went in and I pointed out that when you look at these two ETFs, they're both financial ETFs, but the FXO is a financial services ETF that is truly financial services. Almost 100% of the ETF is in the financial space. But the IYF, which is also the name just says financial services ETF or financial ETF, the breakdown's a little bit different. Financial services represents 79%, but you've got a real estate component of 21%. And so you might be getting into this thinking you're putting all your money into financials when in fact, a fifth of your investments going into real estate. And you say, okay, that's no big deal. Well, it is a big deal if you wanna get into financials because if you look at this chart, this is the FXO, which is the ETF without any real estate and the IYF, which is an ETF with real estate, the 21%. And I've got a price relative chart here showing how the FXO does relative to the IYF. Now, if you look at this, you'll see that the from March of 2020 through March of 2021, the FXO did so much better than the IYF. And if you wanna know why, during the same period, real estate uh, consistently underperformed financials. So if you've got an ETF and you think you're in financials, well, guess what? If you've got a real estate component or you've got any other kind of component of other sectors, that's going to impact your performance. And I don't think a lot of folks realize that or even think about it when they get in. They just are putting their money thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to work in ETFs that they don't fully understand. And they don't even know a lot of times what they're investing in. Now, if that's part of your plan and you want that diversification, you want having a little bit of real estate, that's fine. That's part of your plan. But if you're just not doing your homework and you're just getting into this and you're thinking that you're in an e uh, a financial ETF and don't realize that you could have been doing much better in a financial ETF that truly invested 100% in financials, that's kind of a big deal. On this chart also, you can see when real estate started to outperform financials, then the FXO was underperforming. And now as real estate again underperforms financials, look at the FXO outperforming again. So it, this is just one little small example of all the different nuances that you need to be aware of if you're putting together an ETF portfolio. Again, is you know which one is better than the other? That's up to you. What it really depends on what your style is, what you're trying to accomplish. But if you don't know what the ETF owns, you can't possibly be putting together a portfolio that you know has some thought and, and uh, um, strategy behind. So anyway, I just wanted to point out those two articles. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to spend um, a lot more time. And, and by the way, before I show you the uh, Excel spreadsheet, I pulled up an energy fund on, this is Yahoo Finance website, but I pulled up the FENY and it's an energy index. And where I get a lot of the information most of the time is from Yahoo Finance. Sometimes I'll go into Fidelity if I need to, or some other area that gives me the information I need. But you can see here, here's the sector weightings. So if you're getting into this MSCI energy index ETF, FENY is the ticker symbol, you can feel pretty comfortable whatever amount of money you're putting in is going directly into energy, 100%, 99.85%. I'd say that's pretty close to 100%. Then if you go down a little bit further, you'll see the top 10 holdings. Two things really important. Number one, you can look and see what the investments are in. You know, Do you like these stocks? Maybe you don't like some of the stocks. 
Um, but you also can see the top 10 holdings and the percentage of the entire ETF. This ETF, top 10 holdings is 67% of the ETF. So if you were to pull up the charts and you started looking at them and maybe you're seeing negative divergences on some of the charts or you're seeing some, uh, you know, maybe the AD lines, accumulation distribution lines are going down even though the price is going up. Maybe there are just a couple of these charts in here that you're not quite sure of. You know, that might impact whether or not this is the ETF that you want to choose. The other thing is look at the top two holdings, ExxonMobil and Chevron. 38% of this entire ETF is in two stocks. So if you're buying this ETF and you think you're diversifying into all of these different energy names, well, you're not. You're heavily investing in Exxon and Chevron. So if you had, I don't know, if you have a million dollar portfolio and you said, hey, I want 10% of this in energy or maybe even 20%, I don't know, whatever you, know, you wanna do. Um, but let's say you put 20%, well, 22% of that 20% is going to be an Exxon Mobil. So I would hope that you like the stock um, before you start putting that kind of money in an ETF. You need to know, at least be aware of the top 10 holdings and whether or not, I mean, some of the ETFs I'll show you on our spreadsheet in a couple minutes, some of them will have a percentage of total assets. Top 10 holdings might be less than 10%. That's obviously a widely diversified ETF. When the top 10 holdings are less than 10%, your money is being spread out a ton. Because some, you know, I've had discussions also with folks who say, well, you know, I only have five ETFs. That's not enough. I'm not diversified. Well, it depends what your ETFs are invested in. I mean, if you've got five ETFs that are widely diversified across all different sectors and have hundreds of stocks in them, I don't know how much more diversified you want to get. So it's not how many. ETFs you have, it's also their concentration. And if you don't know that, how do you know if you have a diversified portfolio or a highly concentrated one? You don't. So that all leads me. And by the way, the last thing I'll show you is on the S&P 500, the whole purpose of this, you know, you can get representation. You can invest in the U.S. stock market by just buying the spider, SPY. And you might say, well, my gosh, I don't want to be you know, invested just in one ETF. Um, why, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not diversified at all. Well, the spider, you can see 24% in technology, 14% in financial services, 13% in healthcare, 14% uh, or excuse me, 12% consumer discretionary or consumer cyclical, 11% communication services. You can see, yes, you are getting representation across every sector. Now, are you concentrated in technology? Yes. And when you pull up the top 10 holdings, you're going to see that 6% of your investments in Apple, another 5.5% in Microsoft, 4% in Amazon, 27% of the spider is represented by these 10 stocks. So yes, you are definitely concentrated in some big names. Some people might say, hey, that's great. I love Apple and Microsoft and Amazon. These are great companies. They're going to grow over time. I'm comfortable putting my money in, like into the spider. Others might say that's just too much. I don't want my, I'd rather be spread out. I, I feel more comfortable if I'm investing in a lot more companies. So this is the, the benchmark, if you will. This is kind of when you see the spreadsheet that I'm about to show you, this is really what we're working against. If we want to create a portfolio and have a strategy that's working for us, it's really, I'm using it against this benchmark. Whatever I develop, I have to be comfortable that what I end up with is exactly what I want versus what the S&P 500 can provide me. Hopefully that makes sense. So in other words, if I'm going into next quarter and I love technology stocks, I really, really love technology stocks. Well, the spider is going to get me 24% of my money in technology. Maybe I want 30 or 35% of my money in technology. Maybe I want 50%. I mean, everybody's different. Who knows? Well, you can do that with the ETF analyzer. So let me go ahead and um, switch this out now. I'm gonna just stop sharing for one minute and then we'll bring this up.
but I think this is one of the coolest features we have. I am, I love talking about this because I think if you're an ETF investor, I think this is the best ETF product that I've ever seen. And I've seen a bunch and I'm, maybe I'm a little biased, um, but I think this is a really, really cool uh, spreadsheet. So what we've done is you remember when I showed you the scan that I ran and it comes up with all the ETFs and then I narrow it down and I take out India and you know whatever different countries you know outside the US and I narrow it down and I get down to last month, 35 ETFs. That's what we had last month, 35. So what we do is we put in the ticker, we put in their name, um, the top 10 holdings, you'll see where this comes from in just a minute but here is your top 10 holdings. Um, and then we spread, we show you the allocation. So this Global X cybersecurity ETF is made up of 100% technology companies. So if you're looking for an ETF that's really heavy into technology, or maybe cybersecurity is a niche within technology that you really feel good about, and you feel like, hey, that's an area I wanna own. Well, here you go. You can take a look and you know put together whatever ETFs you want. And I'll show you how you can do that in just a minute. But the whole point here is all of these ETFs are listed. Every one of them you can see has this breakdown between all of the different sectors, the 11 sectors. We have this little audit over here to make sure that everything when you add it across is 100%. So hopefully all of them are, I think they are. Um, and then if you come all the way out here to the right, what I've done is I've added up the aggressive, defensive, and neutral. And the aggressive are going to be the, the five aggressive sectors. You're going to be, have technology, consumer discretionary, communication services, financials, and industrials. So I'm going to add up the percentages in those five sectors, and I'm going to put it here. Defensive are going to take on healthcare, um, the um, uh, consumer staples, real estate and utilities. And then neutral, what I call neutral, is energy and materials. Um, to me, energy and materials can lead or lag. It has nothing to do with whether investors have a aggressive or defensive mindset. We saw energy leading back in, you know, in 2002 to 2007. During that bull market, energy was a major leader. Energy carried the market to the upside. In the last 10 years, outside of this past year, energy has been horrible. Even with the major rally we've seen in the last 12 months, energy is by far the worst performing sector in the last decade. So it doesn't matter whether we're in a bull market or a bear market. I think energy and material kind of do their own thing. And so that's why they're over here in this neutral column. But um, anyway, all, all of this information um, is available in our spreadsheet to any of our members that download this. Um, and it changes once a month. So when it changes, we'll notify you, say, hey, here's your strong ETF chart list. If you're a member at Stock Charts, you can download it, but you don't have to be a member there. I mean, you can still get our spreadsheet whether you're a member at Stock Charts or not. So you can still be kind of playing around. The other thing that's really cool in the spreadsheet is you don't have to use the ETFs that we have. If you want to you know, you might have two or three of your favorites and you can go into Yahoo Finance or go to Fidelity and you can put the ticker symbol in, um, do your own top 10 holdings percentage, look at those stocks, and then you can go into Yahoo Finance like I showed and just put your own breakdown in here. Just make sure it, it totals 100% out here uh, so you've put in everything. And then when you go to do your process of selecting your ETFs, you can select that one. So we've given you room to do your own and to figure out you know, whether or not your portfolio you know, makes sense. So let me just give you a, a quick little rundown. And by the way, this isn't gonna take a whole lot. We're gonna be done here in about 10 or 15 minutes. So if you got things to do, got college football to watch or whatever, uh, not a problem. Um, or you got other family things going on, whatever. Uh, we're not gonna be in here much longer. And this is being recorded. So you can always, um, you know, go back and review it later for any reason you need to leave. But what I'm going to show you here, and just to make it simple, I'm just going to show you if I put 20% here, 20% here, 20% here, 20% here, and let's say I put 21% here. 
well, this is going to come up as an error because now what you're talking about doing is putting 101%. Well, you can't put more than 100% in. So that tells you that it's got to equal 100%. It tells you it's 101. So I'm going to go back and now I'm going to change this to 20. So now I've got no error. Now I've got you know, 20% in each of these first five funds. And that's how I'm going to, that's how I'm going to invest. Well, th your results, what, what this does is it calculates your percentage times each of the uh, sector percentages. And it adds all of it together. And you can now see that if you put, if you invest like this, 78% of your money is going to be invested in technology whereas the S&P 500 is only 24%. So if technology does well, you're going to have a landfall or a windfall, not a landfall, a windfall. If it does poorly though, guess what? You're not going to be very happy with your results. And when you go across some of these other areas, let's say healthcare does great. Well, the S&P 500 has got 13%. You've only got 2%. So you're not going to benefit from that. So the whole point is trying to put together a um, a, a group of ETFs that gets you your desired results. So in other words, I might look at this and I'm just going to get rid of these for now. So I might look at this and say, well, um, you know, consumer discretionary, maybe when we finish with this, I'll show you a couple charts um, and give you some idea of some of the things I'm going to be looking at next week when we put together our portfolio. Um, but let's say, you know, I'm, I'm putting this together and Consumer discretionary is an area that I really want to make sure I overweight. Maybe I want 25% instead of the 12%. It might be an area that I really feel good about. And so what you can do is simply scroll down this column right here and just look for the ETFs that have high percentages of consumer discretionary. Well, 94% of this one, this is the consumer discretionary um, select sector spider or SPDR, 94% is in consumer discretionary. Okay, so here, um, this is obviously one that I might wanna wait a little bit more. So maybe I'd wanna put, you know, 10% directly right into this ETF. 10% times 94%, there's your 9.4. I'm already up to 9.4%. And as I start adding other ETFs that have consumer discretionary in it, you know, maybe, this Fidelity NASDAQ composite index tracking stock. Maybe I want to put 20%. Well, now 20% of 15% is another 3%, which added to that 9% gives me to 12. I'm already up in just 30% of my entire portfolio. I'm already to that 12% threshold. So you can see how you can start gearing these things toward whatever it is your, your goal. Uh, happens to be. So you might look at energy, um, you know, last week and recently energy has been on fire. I mean, if I have one regret going back the last year is that I wasn't more involved in energy. Um, now, good news is I've been uninvolved in energy for about 10 years. So I avoided nine years of significant underperformance. But this year, it's come back. I just don't trust it because I'm still a fan of the dollar going higher. I don't want to get into all of that. But anyway, uh, energy last week had a great week, but the S&P 500 didn't do as anywhere near as well as energy. Why? Because energy is only 3% of the S&P 500. So as energy has been underperforming for the last decade, the percentage of energy companies, the valuations within the S&P 500 have continued to dwindle and dwindle and dwindle. So when we have a big week in energy, it has almost no impact on the S&P 500. Now on the other side is technology. When technology is weak, it's hard for the S&P 500 to do much because technology is 24% of the weighting. So again, you've got to be aware of different factors. And I'll throw one more factor in here. I think incredibly important. I believe we are in the midst of a tremendous secular bull market that began in 2013. I've been saying it over and over and over again. I know there are a lot of critics who just say, well, you're a perma bull. Well, in a secular bull market, it pays to be a perma bull. I'll, I'll just say that. It's not like I won't write negative things about the market when I feel like it's warranted, but
but I'm not looking for long-term negative um, consequences in, by investing in stocks. I, d I think we're going higher and I think we're going a lot higher over time. And I'm talking about over the next 10 years. Now, the point I wanted to make is that since 2013 in this secular bull market, and I use 2013 because that's when we took out the S&P 500 high from 2000 and 2007. We bottomed in 2009, but we didn't actually clear those two prior highs until 2013. And to me, that's the definition of a new secular bull market being created. Since that time, technology has, I don't know what the exact number is, maybe three times, has moved up three times the S&P 500. So I don't know if the S&P 500 since then is up 150%, technology, the XLK is up 450%. So S&P 500 done well by owning technology, but if you own 30% technology or 40% technology, that's going to help you during secular bull markets where aggressive groups have a history of outperforming. Aggressive sectors tend to out, well, they don't tend, they outperform during secular bull markets. Defensive groups, consumer staples right here, real estate, utilities, healthcare, these four groups, they don't lead for long periods of time in secular bull markets. If they do, you better start thinking maybe the secular bull market's coming to an end. Um, that's what happened back in 2007, 2006. Consumer staples was outperforming. I think consumer staples relative to consumer discretionary um, moved to like a five-year relative high when the S&P 500 was topping in 2007. So I'm not saying you don't want to have representation in those areas, but for me, knowing the history of the market, I'm going to skew my uh, percentages a little bit more toward the aggressive groups. And then the key is, okay, among the five aggressive groups, where do you want to lean? You know, now if you're somebody and hey, there's two sides of a market, you can disagree with me. You can say the market's way overpriced and we're going to, you know, we're going down and I don't want to be in aggressive groups. I want to be in defensive groups. That's fine. That's a call that you can make. And, you know, whatever makes you comfortable is what you, you should be doing. No, not necessarily listening to me, uh, but that it, you can still set this up however you want. You can go in and put your percentages in and figure out your results. And if you don't like the results you're getting, like I said, go down here, find the ETFs that you like, maybe the defensive ETFs, put them in here, put your percentages in. And then, you know, when you come up here, it'll total it all in as well. It's looking at the entire spreadsheet, not just the ETFs that I show. All right. So hopefully you got a little bit of a flavor here. I think this is such a cool spreadsheet. Um, but I want to show you the next tab. So I told you the top 10 holdings here. These percentages are coming from another tab. So if I just look at BUG, the cybersecurity ETF, 57%, I can go back here and look at the holdings of BUG. And all this is, one, two, three, four, five, going across the top. This is simply mirroring the one, two, three, four, five coming down here. So they're all going to be lined up perfectly. So BUG, 57%. I go back here. I look at it. Zscaler is the number one stock. CrowdStrike, number two. And you can see the top 10 right here, 57% of this entire ETF is invested in these top 10 holdings. So you might want to look at the top 10 companies and make sure you're comfortable. Now, again, you might like this because it's technology and maybe you don't want the Apples and the Microsofts. Maybe you want cybersecurity, uh, you know, which is a much more uh, niche area of technology. Um, but the whole point is you can come back here and you can take a look. Now, when you look at the percentages, the higher the percentage, the more heavily concentrated the ETF is going to be in a smaller number of companies. That might be great for you. You may love that, or you might not. For instance, this medical devices ETF, 71% is invested in their top 10 holdings. So if we go back, this is ETF number 11. So you just scroll over here to 11 and here it is. 
the IHI for stocks are almost 50% of the ETF. So if you're getting into the IHI and you don't do any homework whatsoever, you might think you're very diversified. Well, when you look at our ETF analyzer spreadsheet, you can see you are not um, heavily diversified and in, instead you're heavily concentrated in four names. So if, you, if this happens to be an ETF where you put 20% in, you have to understand that 20% of 12%, which is about 2.5%, is going 2.5% of your entire portfolio is in this stock. Maybe that's okay with you. Maybe it's not. The point is, at least you know it. And you're making a conscious decision to make your investments this way. Um, now, if you look at these ETFs, you can you might be able to see, I don't know how clearly it comes across, but you might see that some of these, e, these uh, names within the ETF, the top 10 holdings, are bold. You can see that they're in bold lettering. Um, these are all companies that are included in our stock portfolios. So those are stocks that we feel really good about that have been leaders. And that's why we include them in our stock portfolios. So when you look at the holdings, you can see if any stocks in the ETF also are in our um, individual stock portfolios that we, we keep at uh, earnings beats. We do those every 90 days, just like we do the model ETF portfolio. So um, I don't know, that's pretty much what I wanted to go over here. So you know the percentages, you can come back and take a look at the stocks that are in here and just get a sense if you know this is you know, where, how you want to go. And then you put together all of your percentages. You know, once you find the ETFs that you like, maybe you put 25% in this, uh, uh, you know, in this particular ETF. And then you get to the end and you don't like the numbers, you know, and maybe you have uh, 25% in there and maybe you have 10% in this one. And then later, maybe you're looking at it and it's not getting you what you want. So maybe you just go in and say, okay, I'll do 20 here and I'll just do, and I'll do 15 here. So you're still going to have that same, relationship, but it's giving you now a lot more or a lot less technology because that was 81%. If you go from 25 to 20, you're lowering your technology. And then by upping that by 5%, you're going to be upping your energy. So it's just a matter of running the numbers and getting the, the results to be what you want. And also looking to see if it's the type of diversification you want or concentration. You know, you could be looking at this and saying, you know what, I want technology stocks, but, you know, I want something that's heavy in technology. So I'm looking at this Renaissance IPO, but I don't want a lot of it in Apple or Microsoft. Well, if you go to the IP, this uh, IPO, ticker symbol IPO, that's number 12, you can go over and you can see, well, okay, it's Snowflake, it's Palantir, it's Peloton, um, Netflare. Coinbase, I mean, Airbnb, uh, DoorDash. So it's got all these newer companies that have come out. It has nothing to do with Apple. And again, without looking at it, it doesn't, you know, ETFs don't tell you the whole story. And I, I really worry sometimes that a lot of investors simply look at the name and just invest. And I'm talking thousands of dollars and don't have any idea whether they're diversified, what stocks they own whether their portfolio is meeting any kind of an objective. I mean, if you're doing this, I think you should be putting more thought behind it in trying to build for your financial future, not taking too many risks, unless that's what you want to do. If you want to take those risks and you want 50% in technology, that's fine. That's your call. But do you know when you own ETFs, what these percentages are? Do you know what you own? Because I think a lot of folks trade ETFs and don't have a clue what they own. All right, I'm gonna give you a couple of thoughts and we're gonna wrap up here in about 10 minutes or less. Um, but I'm gonna give you a couple of thoughts. I wanna go back and look at these charts for a minute. Um, and just tell you kind of a couple of themes, a couple of things that I'm thinking about as I look at the, uh, as I look at the market. So let me grab the chart again and I'll share my screen. All right, should have uh, me back at stock charts at the article. So let's go take a look at a couple charts. 
First thing I want to do is I'm going to pull up the XL, XLY relative to the S&P 500. I want to show you something. Now, I'm going to do this on a daily chart, and I'm going to go back, I don't know, 10 years. And don't really care about the volume. I'm going to switch candlesticks to a line chart, which I always use for price relative charts. Um, and then I don't. Well, let me go ahead and bring the price action up of the XLY. All right, so on this chart, you can see that consumer discretionary relative to the S&P 500, that's what this is. This is not just consumer discretionary. This is consumer discretionary on a relative basis versus the S&P 500. So when it's going up, it means it's going up faster than the S&P. When it's going down, it's going down more than the S&P. Or it, the S&P could be going up and consumer discretionary is just not going up as much. So again, it's a relative performance. I think when you look back over the last 10 years, I, I think you can see that it goes up more than it goes down overall. So if during a secular bull market, if you were heavily concentrated in consumer discretionary, no doubt you're going to have bumps in the road where you go through periods of underperformance. But overall, I think over the last 10 years, you would be pretty happy if you were overweighting consumer discretionary, right? Well, a couple of things I wanted to show you here. Number one, um, maybe I had this on a weekly chart. Let me, let me go out of here for a second and I'm thinking maybe the week, maybe the, I did have a weekly. Yeah, I did have a weekly. Okay, so forget the daily. I mean, it still shows the same thing. It's just a weekly chart instead of a daily. But let me annotate because I want to show you a couple of things, which I think is really cool. Number one, um, you can see when the downtrend breaks. And I'm going to use a diff different color here. So... On a relative basis, you can kind of see there a little downtrend, maybe even a channel, kind of see that channel there. Um, kind of the same thing here. You get a little bit of a channel or maybe, I don't know if it's a, it's a real narrow channel, but a channel nonetheless. Um, and then you got this downtrend. My point is, notice two things on this chart. The first thing I want you to notice is the relative PPO. So this PPO, because this chart is a relative chart, this PPO isn't giving us the PPO of the XLY. It's giving us the PPO, or it's a momentum um, indicator. It's giving that to us of the XLY relative to the S&P 500. So whenever this PPO is in negative territory, it means that the momentum, the relative momentum, is that we're moving lower. And you can kind of see that in these periods where we have these downtrends, see that PPO dropping down. Well, when we come up and we break out of these to the upside, notice that minus one level has kind of been the area where we really start to see some outperformance in consumer discretionary. You see it there, 2014, 2015, coming off that minus one. Here off the minus one, look at 2018 into 2019. Here in early 2020, coming out of the pandemic, minus one, we break out, move back to the upside, and look where we've been here at minus one, and look at what we're just starting to do. And the other thing I'll point out is this, well, I could show you, it's a little bit of a, um, a bullish wedge, but it's a relative bullish wedge. Usually you see wedges on stock charts, you know, individual stock charts, or maybe uh, industry groups or sectors or whatever. Here, this is on a relative chart. I think it's still very useful. Knowing that we have been through this period of underperformance in a secular bull market, you got to think, I, I think of, of the five aggressive groups in a secular bull market, much like I think of a turnstile or um, the revolving door that you have going into hotels, how the you just kind of go around and around and around. Well, to me, that's what happens with rotation. 
money kind of goes around and around and around. Now, technology seems to get it more than its fair share, followed by consumer discretionary and communication services, and then financials and industrials. Financials and industrials tend to just have their sudden bursts, and then they kind of cool off. I think longer term, technology, um, consumer discretionary, communication services, these are the areas, in my opinion, that I would want to overweight. Um, now, there are periods when yields are rising, like if you're actively managing your ETFs, when you see the yields break out, and I talked about this a couple of weeks with our members a couple of weeks ago, when the yield broke out above 140, I was saying, hey, financials, that's the group that tends to outperform when we get the breakout. And that's exactly what we've seen. Now, if yields go back to 140, you know, go back and test that area, financials are not going to do well during that period. It's just the way the market works. So, you know, financials and industrials can be a little bit more challenging to try and catch their moves when they're outperforming. But I think over time, owning these five sectors, areas of the market in a secular bull market are going to pay some nice dividends, um, both literally and figuratively. All right, um, so that I wanted to point out, because now I'm, this is why I want to be a little bit more heavy into consumer discretionary names, because the market's telling me that when we get these breakouts, we hit that minus one line. This is typically when we begin to see outperformance in consumer discretionary. It doesn't mean consumer discretionary is going to go higher. It could be that the S&P goes lower and consumer discretionary just doesn't go down as much. That's outperformance. Um, so, you know, keep all of that in mind. The other thing I wanted to point out is I'm going to go to a seasonal chart and just show you the XLI, which is industrials. And just looking back over the last nine years, which is, okay, the secular bull market, 2013 is when it began. So during this secular bull market, the XLI has gone up every November to the tune of an average of 5.6%. Look at everything else. The, be the second best month is July, 2.1% along with February. I mean, nothing is close to November. So if you're putting together a portfolio, you might want to consider the fact that seasonality seems to be favoring industrials. And when I look at a chart on the industrials, you can see it just broke out above the 20-day moving average. And a big component of the industrials is transports. Transport's just now breaking back up above their 20. I'd love to see transports take out this high because we got these pat this pattern, lower lows, lower highs. We get back through 15,000 on transports and I think we're gonna make a beeline for that 16,000 area. So that's something to keep an eye on. I already own the IYT, which is an ETF that tracks the transports. I like it. I was on the pitch on the Stock Charts TV show recently and it was one of my five, my five ideas was the IYT and I talked about the seasonality. So if you look at the IYT and you compare it to the S&P 500, you can see the last five years, the IYT has outperformed the S&P 500. Last six years, it's outperformed. Then it didn't seven years ago, seven of the last eight, eight of the last nine, nine of the last 10, 10 of the last 11, 11 of the last 12, 12 of the last 13, and then we drop. 12 of the last 13 years, this transportation ETF has outperformed the S&P 500. That's what that 92% is telling us. And then the average outperformance is 2.5 percentage points. Look at the rest of the year, nowhere close. So, you know, when we put together our model ETF portfolio, we're trying to take into account everything I've talked about here in this hour. So I'm basically done, John. I don't know if uh, there are some questions that I can answer, but I'd be happy to stick around. Yes, a couple of, um, hold on, sorry about that. A couple of things. In the, earlier in the session, you referred to scooters and a PPO. Uh, so one question from the same person, why can't we use scooter greater than 90% or 90? And, you are, and then the second thing regarding PPO, um, 0.5, maybe you can make sense of this. It says you need to add a, cum a condition to check about yesterday, it's not greater than 0 
I'm not sure what that means. Maybe you understand it. Um, yeah, I'm not quite sure what that condition would do. I mean, if it was, I mean, I'm just concerned that as of the date that I'm running the scan, that it's above 0 0.5. I just want to make sure that the PPO is positive, given the current market environment. I mean, the stock market's been weak. Uh, we've had the last week or, or excuse me, last month or so has been pretty challenging throughout September and into early October. I mean, I could even lower that, to be honest, to try to get more of other areas of the market because you're not going to find any technology ETFs coming up with, or very few, with um, PPOs greater than 0.5 right now because on a daily chart, technology has taken a big hit over the last five weeks. So that's going to kind of rule that out. Well, I may not want to rule it out. I mean, I know September is historically not very good for some areas of the market, but that doesn't mean November and December aren't going to be better. So I'm going to be playing around with the scan syntax and trying to figure out uh, how I want to set it up. As far as the scooter question goes, yeah, I mean, you can run 70, you can run 90, you can run, you know, it's open for whatever you're looking for. Um, I think, again, the scooter... I think the scooters is a great tool. Don't get me wrong. Stock charts, technical rank, again, developed by John Murphy. He did a great job. But every indicator, I don't care what you're using, every indicator has its limitations. And one of the things I don't like about the scooter is that it only takes into account, if you go through the formula, it doesn't take account anything past five months ago. You're looking at what's transpired over the past five months. So right now, everything energy related has got these huge, scooter scores. But if you look at a 10-year chart of energy, essentially what you've done is you've gotten back the pandemic losses. The long-term chart on energy is still awful, but you wouldn't know it by looking at the scooters. So if you look at the scooters, you just think I've got these great stocks or ETFs. And I think you got to be a little careful and just use a little common sense. Just know that one of the limitations of the scooter score is that it does not take into account anything that has happened prior to five, maybe six, five, six months ago. Okay. A couple of quick questions, we'll wrap it up. ETF providers say that volume isn't an issue because they can create units at any time to ensure orders are filled. Any comments? Um, that is absolutely correct. Um, the problem is if it doesn't trade a lot of shares, as I mentioned earlier, my experience is you gotta be careful between the bid and the ask on these ETFs. Some of them that are not traded frequently, you've got wider bids and asks. And if you trade a lot of ETFs, if you're buying and holding for 10, 20 years, not a big deal. But if you're actively trading them, those with less volume, in my experience, that when I've watched them, they tend to have wider uh, bid asks. And that may be a factor. It's just something I'm gonna throw out there. And it's one of the reasons because we are getting in and out of these every three months. To me, that's a factor that we want to consider. So normally, I will have some sort of a minimum number of shares. Sometimes it's 200,000. Sometimes it's 100. It really depends on how many uh, ETFs I'm getting returned from all of my scan, uh, scan criteria that I'm using. So I might have 200,000. I might want to get more, more ETFs returned. And so I might just go down to 100,000 to try to get more of those ETFs. Hopefully, that helps to explain that. Okay. With, with stock charge, how do I set five-day EMA over 13-day EMA cross over for SPY? Um, well, I don't do crossovers. I'm trying to think if there's a pre... I'm, I'm assuming the question is asking, how do you write that in a scan? Um, a lot of times what I'll do... I mean, I'd have to look it up because I, I just don't do the crossovers. But if you go into scans and go down to predefined scans... Here's a, a bullish 50 200 day moving average crossover. So if you pull that up, up here in the right, with all of the predefined scans, you can click here to edit the scan and it'll tell you how that crossover was done. Um, so I'm trying to see if there's, yeah, I guess what they're using here is a less than equal sign. So today, the 50 is greater than the 200. Yesterday, it was below. So I'm guessing you could just use this and just substitute your five and your 13-day periods. 
um, that's where I would start. But they do have a lot of uh, information. If you if you just you know hit this and go in and search scanning or how to write a scan, there will be a lot of articles and a lot of information on stock charts to to help you with that. Okay, I think with that we're going to wrap up. I do want to remind people we've got a load of events coming up in Monday's Earnings Beats Digest, which everybody in here will get. We'll um, include a link to the events that are upcoming. And you really want to check out, I'm telling you, you take out a 30-day trial. If you ever want to take out a trial, this is a great time to do it with everything coming up. And uh, this is it for us. This is it. Earning season. You know, that's where we really, really shine. So much action going on. So many events coming up. We'll make sure we include a link uh, so everybody can, you know, see what events are coming up. And if you're not a member, take out a 30-day no-cost trial. Uh, if, if nothing else, you'll get access to all these events that are coming up. And um, I'll tell you, Tom, that Max Payne event, the last couple of sessions where you've laid out per, you know, potential trading candidates on individual stocks, we've had some huge winners. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of times there's extreme volatility associated with those stocks because they are heavily traded in options, many of them. Um, and, you know, you do come up upon options expiration and it, a lot of these moves benefit the market maker, which is why we do what we do. Um, you know, there's certainly no guarantees, but for those of you who are interested, I think, you know, I think this is an important part of trading and at least having the knowledge. I mean, if you're going to, you know, for me, rather than actual trading some of these candidates, I just like, you know, if I'm thinking about buying a stock and it's middle of the month and we're getting close to option expiration, Many times I'll go and I'll look at their options and see if they're deep in the money on the call side. And if they are, I won't buy the stock. It's just too risky. So I'll wait. Sometimes it helps me. I may not short the stock to make money from it, but I'll wait and I'll end up buying the stock cheaper based on the information that's provided in these Max Payne webinars. So it's not just about trading you know, now to try to make profit off of it. Sometimes it just helps to assess the risk of, of owning a stock or buying into a stock which I think a lot of folks are not aware of as you get close to uh, the monthly options expiration. So I think that's, okay. a great, I think it's a great webinar and I think everybody should be coming to that monthly webinar. I think it would help in, in just about yeah. everybody's trading. Right, we're going to wrap it up. We'll make sure everybody gets a copy of this recording. Keep an eye out for the EB digest uh, throughout the week. Cause we have all these events coming up and we'll give you more details as they approach. And uh, that's it, Tom, if you're ready to wrap up, we're done. Yeah, I'm ready to wrap up. Everybody have a great day. And we got, like John said, we got a lot of these events coming up. Mark your calendar, though, for next Saturday, that chart fest next Saturday at 11 a.m. Same time, uh, same place. We'll have the room information out to all of our um, EB Digest subscribers and, of course, all of our members as well. And uh, we'll make sure that you get those instructions. And, and uh, even if you can't attend, we do record all of our events, so you get a copy of the recording. But anyway, have a great rest of your weekend. Enjoy it. Uh, try to de de stress a little bit as we go into another week next week in the market. Happy trading, everybody.